Hydrogen is often called the missing piece in the clean energy puzzle. Invisible, yet indispensable. It can power cars, decarbonize heavy industry, and store renewable energy for months. But behind every kilogram of hydrogen produced lies an immense network of production plants, pipelines, storage facilities, ports, and tankers. This is the global hydrogen supply chain, an industrial ecosystem quietly being built to rival the scale and impact of oil. And today, we're diving deep inside it, how hydrogen is produced, stored, and transported across continents, and why this supply chain could redefine the economics of the 21st century energy transition. Hydrogen's appeal comes from its versatility. It's not a fuel we extract, and it's a fuel we make. But depending on how we make it, hydrogen can be either clean or carbon intensive. The supply chain starts with production, and right now the world is developing three main colors of hydrogen. Gray, produced from a natural gas through steam, methane reforming, Blue, the same process but with carbon capture. And green, produced from water using renewable electricity in a device called an electrolyzer. While gray hydrogen still dominates, supplying roughly 95 million tons annually, green hydrogen is the fastest growing. In fact, over 500 large-scale green hydrogen projects are now under development worldwide, representing more than $110 billion in committed capital. Let's start at the very beginning of the chain. Production. The most common method for green hydrogen is electrolysis. Inside an electrolyzer, water is split into hydrogen and oxygen using electricity. If that electricity comes from solar, wind, or hydropower, the resulting hydrogen is carbon-free. The key technologies here are alkaline, PM, and solid oxide electrolyzers. Alkaline electrolyzers are proven, robust, and cost-effective making them ideal for large plants. PM electrolyzers using proton exchange membranes are faster and can adjust quickly to fluctuating renewable power, making them perfect for hybrid solar wind systems. Solid oxide electrolyzers, still emerging, can reach higher efficiencies by operating at elevated temperatures, ideal for integration with industrial heat or nuclear reactors. The challenge is economics. Today, producing green hydrogen costs between $4 and $8 per kilogram, while natural gas-based gray hydrogen can be made for around $1.50 per kilogram. The race to lower this cost, the Levelized Cost of Hydrogen, or LCOH, drives the global hydrogen economy. Developers are scaling up electrolyzer factories, automating balance of plant systems, and securing cheaper renewable electricity to hit the holy grail, $2 per kilogram. That's the point where green hydrogen becomes competitive with fossil fuels in ammonia, steel, and mobility applications. A few real-world projects illustrate this shift. In Saudi Arabia's Eniyam project, one of the largest green hydrogen plants ever conceived, developers are installing 4 gigawatts of renewable energy to power 2 gigawatts of alkaline electrolyzers. When operational, Eniyam will produce around 600 tons of hydrogen per day, enough to make 1.2 million tons of green ammonia per year for export. In Spain, Iberdrola's Puerto Llano project integrates solar power, a 20 megawatts electrolyzer, and green hydrogen for fertilizer production at Fertiberia's plant. And in Japan, a network of smaller distributed electrolyzers is being tested to supply hydrogen for mobility, from buses to port logistics, proving that the technology can scale both up and down. Once hydrogen is produced, the next critical step is storage. Unlike oil, hydrogen is a light gas, and that creates engineering challenges. At atmospheric conditions, one kilogram of hydrogen occupies about 11 cubic meters of volume. That means it must be compressed, liquefied, or bound chemically to store it efficiently. Each method affects the economics and safety of the supply chain. Compressed hydrogen storage uses high-pressure tanks, typically between 350 and 700 bar, similar to what's used in fuel cell vehicles or industrial trailers. This method is simple and widely available, but limited in scale, suitable for short-term storage and transport over moderate distances. Liquid hydrogen, by contrast, is cooled to 253 degree Wernang, 
This reduces its volume by 800 times, making it ideal for large-scale transport and aviation or maritime applications. But liquefaction consumes about 30% of hydrogen's energy content, requiring extremely cold cryogenic infrastructure and high capital costs. Then there's solid or chemical storage, an exciting research frontier. Materials like metal hydrides, ammonia, and liquid organic hydrogen carriers, LOHCs, can store hydrogen in chemical bonds and release it later. For example, ammonia, NH3, is three parts hydrogen and one part nitrogen. It's easier to ship and store than pure hydrogen, and global ammonia infrastructure already exists. That's why projects like NEOM plan to export hydrogen in ammonia form. It's dense, stable, and compatible with existing ports. Japan, South Korea, and Europe are investing heavily in ammonia cracking technologies to convert imported ammonia back into hydrogen when needed. But hydrogen isn't only about storage, it's about distribution and transport. The challenge is to move hydrogen from production centers, often in remote renewable regions, to demand hubs in cities and industrial zones. The world is developing several approaches, pipelines, ships, and on-road distribution networks. Pipelines are the backbone of any mature hydrogen economy. They can carry vast volumes of hydrogen efficiently, just as natural gas pipelines do today. However, hydrogen's small molecules can cause embrittlement, weakening certain steels. Retrofitting existing natural gas pipelines can work if materials and seals are compatible, but in many cases, new hydrogen-dedicated pipelines will be required. Europe is already moving forward with this. The European Hydrogen Backbone Initiative envisions over 40,000 kilometers of pipelines by 2040, connecting 21 countries. About two-thirds of that length could reuse existing natural gas lines, reducing costs dramatically. The idea is to link North Sea wind hydrogen projects with industrial users in Germany, France, and the Netherlands, effectively creating a hydrogen supergrid Meanwhile, maritime transport is opening new frontiers. In 2023, Japan and Australia celebrated the world's first liquefied hydrogen shipment using the specially designed carrier Suiso Frontier. The ship carried hydrogen produced in Australia's Latrobe Valley from Lignite, captured the CO2, and shipped the LH2 to Kobe, Japan. Though the project used fossil-based hydrogen, it demonstrated that long-distance liquefied hydrogen shipping is possible. Future routes will likely carry green hydrogen or ammonia from places like Chile, Namibia, or Oman to importers in Europe and Asia. These supply corridors could resemble the oil trade of the past century. But this time, the cargo will be zero carbon molecules. In land transport, tube trailers remain crucial for smaller volumes especially in early markets. These are high-pressure tanks mounted on trucks, supplying fueling stations, chemical plants, and pilot projects. For example, the U.S. Department of Energy supports regional hydrogen hubs where local producers deliver compressed hydrogen to stations serving fuel cell trucks and buses. Over time, as pipelines expand, trucking will decline. But it's still the bridge that connects early adopters to the growing network. Beyond the physical logistics, the hydrogen supply chain depends on infrastructure synchronization, ensuring production, storage, transport, and demand evolve together. One of the biggest risks developers face today is the chicken and egg dilemma. No one wants to build pipelines without confirmed demand, but industries won't switch to hydrogen unless supply is reliable. Governments are stepping in to close this gap. The U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, for instance, offers tax credits of up to $3 per kilogram for clean hydrogen production. The European Union's Hydrogen Bank and Important Projects of Common European Interest, ANMOS IPCEI programs, provide similar incentives. These policies aim to de-risk investment until economies of scale take over. Investors and project developers track a key metric here. The delivered cost of hydrogen, sometimes called the hydrogen LCOE equivalent. This includes production, storage, transport, and distribution costs. For example, producing green hydrogen at $2 per kilogram doesn't mean users receive it for $2 per kilogram. 
compression, liquefaction, shipping, and regasification can add another two Wahar threes per kilogram depending on distance. That's why regional hydrogen ecosystems, where production and consumption occur close together, are emerging as the most competitive models in the near term. Think of industrial clusters in Rotterdam, Texas Gulf Coast, or Western Australia, where hydrogen plants, refineries, and chemical users share the same infrastructure footprint. Globally, we're seeing three dominant supply chain archetypes emerge. First, the integrated industrial model. Large, co-located facilities combining renewables, electrolyzers, storage, and downstream users. These are the most efficient because they avoid transport costs. NEOM and Puerto Llano are prime examples. Second, the export-oriented model, where nations with abundant renewables, like Chile, Namibia, or Morocco, produce green hydrogen or ammonia for export. They invest heavily in port terminals, liquefaction plants, and shipping partnerships. For example, Chile's Magallanes region plans to export ammonia to Europe, leveraging its strong wind resources. Third, the import hub model, represented by Japan, South Korea, and Germany. These countries lack renewable resources but have strong industrial demand. They're building hydrogen import terminals, regasification units, and blending networks to receive shipments from global suppliers. Storage technologies will evolve differently across these models. In integrated projects, developers use salt caverns for large-scale underground hydrogen storage. These caverns can hold thousands of tons of hydrogen at pressures up to 200 bar, acting as seasonal energy reservoirs, similar to how natural gas is stored today. The US and Europe already use such caverns in pilot form. In contrast, export projects rely more on ammonia tanks and cryogenic LH2 terminals, while importers focus on cracking units and pipeline integration. Let's not forget digitalization, another key enabler. Managing such a complex global supply chain requires advanced analytics, AI forecasting, and digital twins. Operators now simulate hydrogen production and transport in real time, optimizing for weather patterns, grid prices, and maintenance schedules. At ReneeEnergy.com's H2 Hub, these same digital approaches help developers model project economics, assess risk, and design resilient hydrogen networks that can adapt to fluctuating demand and renewable generation. From a financial standpoint, the supply chain creates diverse investment opportunities. Electrolyzer manufacturers, pipeline operators, port authorities, and ammonia producers each occupy a niche. Institutional investors are forming hydrogen infrastructure funds and export credit agencies are underwriting early projects. The key to bankability lies in long-term off-take contracts and clear policy frameworks. Lenders want predictable cash flows, and governments are learning that policy clarity can unlock billions in private capital. The next five years will determine whether hydrogen remains a niche solution or becomes a pillar of the energy transition. If developers can reduce costs, synchronize infrastructure, and build trust with end users, the hydrogen supply chain could replicate the success of LNG in the early 2000s. The prize is enormous, so a global market potentially worth over $2 trillion by 2050. Yet challenges remain. Electrolyzer supply chains still depend on scarce materials like iridium and platinum. Liquefaction and transport are energy intensive. Policy harmonization across borders is slow. And the world must avoid repeating the mistakes of fossil fuels creating new dependencies or excluding developing nations from value creation. The future hydrogen economy must be inclusive, transparent, and sustainable. Still, progress is undeniable. Every month, new hydrogen corridors are announced. Australia to Japan, Portugal to the Netherlands, the US Gulf Coast to Europe. Each project adds a new link to the chain expanding a global network that could one day make zero carbon molecules as accessible as oil is today. As we look deeper into this transformation, one truth stands out. The global hydrogen supply chain isn't being built by governments or corporations alone. It's being built by a collective of innovators, engineers, financiers, and policymakers working toward a shared goal.
to decarbonize energy at scale. From wind farms powering electrolyzers in deserts, to cryogenic ships crossing oceans, to refineries blending hydrogen into their furnaces, every link matters. And that's where you come in. If you're a developer, consultant, or investor, exploring opportunities in green hydrogen, visit h2hubreneenergy.com. Your gateway to tools, templates, and project insights for the next generation of hydrogen projects. And if you're serious about mastering the business and technical side of this new energy frontier, enroll in reneenergy.com's Green Hydrogen Project Development and Financing course. Learn how to assess feasibility, structure financing, and model the entire project lifecycle, from electrolyzer design to bankable offtake. The hydrogen supply chain is being written now, and the next major success story could have your name on it.